Hello, my friends. Okay, so we've got a kind of special live today. I'm going to bring on Lucas in a few minutes. Um, we're going to talk about streaming as it pertains to the business of music. Uh, so how people get paid, how songwriters get paid, how producers get paid, that sort of thing. What's up, buddy? Can you hear there me? There we go. Can you, can you, you hear me? Can you me? see me? I got you. I can hear and see you. Oh, this is this is tremendous news. Well, I'm, I, I was I'm very to happy. Out, I, I was trying to figure out do not disturb mode, and I realized something funny, which is you have to set it up the first time you use it. And I realized oh, really? that this just this just must be me being a manager. I've never used the do not disturb feature. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, as a uh, producer songwriter, all I do is have do not disturb on all the time. <laughs> I just, I just I don't always mess with it. Pray an emergency and then i'll be the guy it'll be that one hour where i had do not disturb on well you can um as as you will find out when you go into it further you can create a list of people that will uh that will uh, certain kinds of contacts that will override the do not disturb so if my mother calls me or my attorney calls me or you or peter call me uh it will actually go through the do not disturb but everybody my, else uh, gets I, silenced I, the guilt will eat me alive if i exclude any clients or friends from that list so. <laughs> this is why this is why you were manager well, and then it's no you, longer uh, do not disturb mode that's right. That's right. It's just disturb mode. Well, I appreciate you coming on today. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we chatted a bit before. And for those people that haven't watched these before, the, the whole premise of this, which started at the beginning of the pandemic, is basically just to talk to the music people in my life that are knowledgeable that I would ask all these questions to in private. And um, maybe some people will enjoy them. And it seems like they have asking these questions in more of a public forum so people can get some insight that those of us that work in music get to have by knowing interesting people. Um, I know you are a both a very knowledgeable person and a very opinionated person, and I think the perfect person to talk about the streaming, the state of streaming, the state of the music business uh, with. And I thought, as I mentioned to you when, when we spoke earlier, I thought I would start by kind of giving a brief overview to some of my audience who are a lot of younger, amateur, um, aspiring professional record makers of various kinds. Um, basically, a breakdown of like, how we got to this place where tech companies are increasingly the controllers of revenue and payment um, for the music business. Um, so I'll just give like a quick breakdown. Some of this is going to be very simplified. Some of it is probably going to be a little bit incorrect, but it is essentially true. And please, Lucas, please uh, uh, interrupt me or correct me if I make mistakes on this. But Essentially, the music business can be divided into two halves. There's sort of the live component, and then there's the recorded music component. We're not going to talk about the live component, since I don't really have anything to do with it. I know you have a lot to do with it. But in terms of the recorded music component, there are essentially two ways that people make money. One is the copyright or the songwriting, also called music publishing, for reasons that will become obvious shortly. So songwriting, music publishing, and then uh, the master recordings, so the actual ownership of the particular version of the song. So that's record companies, the master recordings. But the side that is getting a lot of discussion these days is the music publishing and songwriting side. Now, the reason it's called music publishing is because in the late 1800s, it was the pre-radio, pre-phonograph, obviously before the internet and all that. The first real uh, re reproducible music business was actual sheet music, hence music publishing. And when the first technology came around in the early 1900s to reproduce copyrights, uh, so reproduce these songs that people wrote, um, the publishing companies were strong enough in order to be able to get Congress to pass some legislation that says anytime you use these compositions, you have to pay you have to pay a standard rate. Now every time technology progressed from there, from radio to the phonograph, CDs, etc., there was already legislation in place for how you had to pay songwriters. Now what has happened recently is that tech companies have come in and I, this is where it gets a little murkier, but using the power of tech lobby and tech money and being able to interpret language a certain way, they are essentially able to pay what is amounting to significantly less money to songwriters. Um, a lot of the money from songwriting gets made from, in the past, has gotten made from selling physical CDs, which pay a certain amount, um, playing on the radio, which pays a certain amount, 
getting synced in TV and film and things like that, which pays a negotiable amount. But those first two are essentially and slowly but increasingly getting eaten up by streaming. So in the way that somebody could write a song that was an album cut on a Celine Dion album that sold 20 million copies and make a serious living if they had a third of that song, that is really no longer the case. If you have an album, an album cut, so not a single, not a song promoted to radio, you are a songwriter and it goes on to a big pop album, unless that specific song streams a ton, you're not going to make a ton of money. So the, a lot of the revenue that people, the, people are used to making as songwriters is much more difficult to make these days. Now, those of us that are also producers, we eat off the, the record label side, the master side, we get paid fees. Um, but as a songwriter as well, I, I, I have, you know, different revenue streams and I do multiple things, but the people that are purely songwriter, songwriters are starting to have a tougher and tougher time of it. Even if they have big songs, they get small pieces of big songs that stream really well. You see lots of numbers, you see hundreds of millions of streams, but even that might not allow somebody to pay their rent for six months or a couple of months or whatever. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's a very, a very quick uh, summary in my mind. You are someone who has uh, been outspoken about a lot of this stuff. You obviously, you manage songwriters, you manage producers, you really advocate for people. Um, any thoughts, initial thoughts, we can kind of take this in any direction that feels useful to you. Um, but I think it's just, again, important to just explain to people how things work. And then we can, from there, figure out what makes sense, what we might want to do. Sure. So, I mean, one of the one of the issues is that you know you have this time to have this, uh, you know, you have you have a, a changing economy in the record industry where a lot of people don't realize in the fifties and sixties, um, you know, the the music business wasn't that big. You know, it's really the seventies, eighties, and nineties where the music business exploded, and there was so much money because of the sales of albums, and you know when you kind of go to the first year I got in the business, which was during Napster, uh, anything would have been an upgrade from just, you know, uh, just what that did to the album. And, you know, you look at Steve Jobs came along and introduced the single, which was an upgrade. Um, the experience, obviously, that, that Apple created and their attention to the consumer was incredible. Um, and then streaming services come along and when we look back in history, uh, in, in, in the books, we'll say, what an amazing time for the business, because for the consumer, all you can eat music for 10 bucks a month is just fantastic. If the consumer, never, if the consumer never needs to think about the creators, um, it's, it's, the greatest, it's the greatest time in the music business. Also, if you go back to 1990, put a pin in the timeline and you say 1990 to today, you have an exponential growth in the amount of art that's being created, probably because uh, lowering the bar barrier of entry created. You know, when I started in the business, hits were made in big, expensive um, recording studios. They're not anymore. Yep. They're bedrooms. I, I love the video from the 90s of Tupac at, I think, Hit, Hit Factory in New York yelling at like the the guys on his team that were messing around in the studios and he's like you know you don't you don't know how expensive this is and we don't have we need to make use of the time and it's just not that way anymore right uh people yeah. are, in this town hit songs are made in bedrooms so um so so there's just this this wide pipe of content and music that exists now that's just getting bigger and bigger every year. I think everybody sees the statistics of how many songs a day are, you know, released on Spotify. It's crazy. Um, and but the, but the barrier of technology, um, you know, just just it became more accessible to to just make to make high high quality music. And so you know you look at that. And then you look at the growth of technology and you look at, uh, say, Spotify, for instance, or Apple Music or the, you know, Tidal, various streaming services. Um, for the consumer, it's really, it's really, really amazing. Um, yeah. And so, unfortunately, what happened along the way there is, you know, the streaming services made deals with the record companies. And it, it's just the music business, it, it always, it comes up over and over again, which is, the major, the majors and their devious behavior. And I don't mind mm. saying that publicly, but it's like, you know, we, we have a business because of the record companies and because of the streaming companies 
we're like I said, when we look in the books, we'll be really grateful for these technology companies. You know, in the sense that Spotify saved the modern record industry. Yeah. So, so I think it's okay to have a conflicting love hate relationship with something. I don't. I never said publicly like screw Spotify. I was always my narrative was, you know, it was so grateful for what they did for the record record industry. We just need to change the percentages that the creators get paid out. So right now, a songwriter gets, you know, like to, if we look at Spotify, 75% of the revenue gets passed through to the major labels or, or to, the, yeah. to the music, the repertoire owner. Um, of that 75%, um, you know, less than a quarter is going to the songwriters and publishers. Um, mm. There's an issue in that when the deals were originally made, there were these big eight-figure deals made with each of the labels where the labels were really in 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 partnership with Spotify. And the streaming services are all a little bit different. Some are guilty, some are less guilty. Uh, there's this other thing going on in the background, which is, you know, which is the, the rate uh, appeal, you know, which is something that, that happened, which we'll get into. Um, yeah. But Essentially, the the streaming services just pay an inequitable portion out to songwriters, and it's our belief that they should pay out a, a higher amount. But that I think in the beginning we pointed our fingers at people like Spotify, and then later realized that this also comes down to the major labels. And so mm -hmm. I think that people have to realize like the major labels are as if not more guilty than Spotify, but they're all complicit together in making these deals, and. And it needs to be adjusted. And so you get these kind of fractured groups of songwriters and songwriters advocacy groups. Some really great people, by the way. The NMPA, yep. the NSAI, um, you know, uh, uh, Sona, some other great, great people. And and what what happens is there's, you know, there's not a union of songwriters. And by federal law, songwriters as independent contractors can't unionize. And so there's these fractured groups of songwriters and advocacy groups that try to advocate for things, and it's never really truly organized. And we're missing one really big thing, which is artists that will step forward against the streaming services and the labels and say, you know, I'm not happy with how my songwriter friends over there are being treated. And so mm. in lieu of an Ed Sheeran or a Taylor Swift or a Beyonce or somebody to step up and say, hey, you know, to create a Rogan, a Joe Rogan issue, you know, type of issue, um, you know, there's there's really nothing that can be done uh, because if you're Spotify, you know, paying attention to the songwriters is a technology company way down the list. You know, I hear people talk about Spotify as a music company over the years. And I was just kind of like, what? when did you think they weren't a tech company? Um, and so certainly... Certainly, it's um, you know it's something that needs to change. We need the artists to step step forward. Another issue that's that's there is that the three major music companies, Sony, so Sony, Warner, and Universal, uh, own the record companies, and then they also own the publishing companies, and they're under their roof. So, if you run the Universal Music Group, it's it's at some point it's about where the dollars come, you know the dollars come in through the door. It doesn't really matter where they get allocated. It's just about getting right. the dollars. And if you read music trades, um, you go read Billboard. You know, monthly you can read about how much money the record companies are making, and you kind of look at it, and it's like this disparity that this chasm that keeps growing between the creators and between the major labels. You know, these some have gone public, some have sold out Spotify shares, some are doing billions in revenue. Um, yeah. You know, one thing that's been amazing about streaming music and why I'm actually as conflicted as I am, I'm more grateful for the streamers than, than not, is that yeah. they created this this kind of hockey stick growth in music rights. You know, so the value of your masters and even your publishing, but the value of your music rights is worth more than ever um, because streaming made it inexpensive enough for more people to sign on, um, you know, pirated music basically out the window at this point. You're adding, you know, streamers are adding, you know, markets like China and India and going into Africa. You know, you've got devices like, you've got deals like Twitch and TikTok and Triller and Peloton and 
10 other workout things I'm not thinking of that use music. There's all the tech that's using, uh, you know, that's using music now. And so the value of these songs is going up and up and up, which is fantastic. We just need to fix, uh, we, we just need to fix the, the, the payout. So uh, going back to what I was saying, your, your universal music group, you got all this money coming in the door through the door. You don't really pay attention or you don't, it doesn't really matter to you where it necessarily goes. Um, one of the issues is that the guys that run the guys and gals that run the publishing companies cannot speak out for the songwriters. Now, one of the reasons we sign publishing deals is to have people to advocate for the songwriters, but they can't speak out on behalf of their songwriters because I don't think their bosses would like that. So I've been pretty vocal about that. Um, I'm friendly with all these people. So it's been a little disruptive, but I, I just, uh, I think that it is a real conflict to not be able to, to speak out on behalf of the people that you represent. And, uh, and so publishers have a little bit of latitude to make uh, deals with the streaming services, not nearly as much as they'll tell you. Um, and so that's one of my big, my big you know, talking points lately is we need the three presidents of the, the major publishing companies to, um, you know, to, to be able to speak out on behalf of the songwriters and try to normalize that rate to what the master owners are getting paid. So it seems like the challenge, there's, there's, the reason this is so tough, I mean, I'm someone who I think really tries to do research and really wrap my head around this, and it, it is, feels complicated for me. Um, there are a lot of contradictory things. I think it is a really important point you said, which is stre the streaming services saved the music industry. I mean, and the, you know, whether they get the moral credit or not, um, it is the case that, you know, you and I are, are roughly the same age and came up in that era where, you know, I, I used to tell people, I started my career, my career started going like this, right as the music industry was going like this. And it was same. basically, a, yeah, you know, a decade uh, of stories from the 90s. Yeah. Uh, you just hear about how great things were just before I got here. Um, and it is, it is frustrating to, and, and also as a music fan, it's amazing to have infinite number of songs at my fingertips at all times. I can listen to music as a fan of music. It's the greatest time ever. And as you said, there are, there are aspects of the revenue which have just exploded. And the question is, how do young creators navigate this in such a way um, to in, or, in order to make a living at music, uh, at making music in some capacity? And then what do we do as an industry and, and who do we push and who do we try to rally with in order to continue to value creators in our society and, and get them paid? Um, you know, one of the things that you said there, which I think a lot of people, some people know, but a lot of people don't is that after app, you know, Steve Jobs basically said, we're going to, we're going to sell devices. And that, that became the music industry through the 2000s is that Apple just made a ton of money selling the music listening device. Um, when people switch from albums to, uh, to buying CD from buying CDs to either buying singles or pirating music, Steve Jobs and Apple, you know, if you, if you own Apple stock, that's, that was a music industry investment that did very well. Um, but then and the record companies very much rejected the idea of that or tried to fight against piracy and all that. But then when streaming came around, not only has it been great for the music industry, but all of, I believe all of the major labels, you would know this better than I, the major labels are all invested in at least Spotify and the streaming services. So not like in cahoots in necessarily some nefarious way, although you could argue that, but the, the record labels, which are the owners of the master side, not the songwriting and publishing, um, are basically have relationships and literal investment with the streaming services. And if it is the case, as you said, that the major record labels are also under the parent company that include most of the major publishers, it doesn't incentivize them to talk about this stuff at well, all. And I, I never thought about that. It, all it is, it's totally nefarious. You know, at least yeah. one of them sold their shares you know, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the streaming services, um, they are on Spotify, sorry. Um, and, and you have two people that had a, have a seat at the table that can make this change for songwriters, the streaming services and the record companies and the record companies aren't hearing their creators and making the change. So that's why I don't pass. And, um, you know, there's something, something that, um, people should know about, which is as a songwriter, with two things, I want to touch on one thing you're saying. One is, you know, as a new creator, 
a new songwriter moving to Hollywood or not, wherever you are, you're, you're, you have to trust the elder states men and women are going to sh- work this out for you. You have to trust the people advocating in D.C. You have to trust um, that there are people. Um, you know, it's funny when the pandemic happened. I said to someone, "There are always people above and below you with bigger problems." You know, like you're in the wheel. This will, you know, things will sort uh, themselves out. I think as a young songwriter, people and or producer, people need to realize like there's people above you with way bigger problems, and these issues will be sorted out. And so, so many of them are being worked through. I think what everybody should always focus on is is being great and and, and attaching the th- attaching themselves to things and creating things that have value because these things are going to get worked out. It's just kind of an awkward time. Um, yeah. and your insurance is again that there are people that are that that have more to lose. Um, so, so I don't I, I don't think it's for the new people to really necessarily figure it out. If you create things that have value. They'll always be valued. It's just an awkward time where it seems that streaming services uh, don't totally value the songwriters. So streaming services had a positive, you know, in, in, in closing on this, a positive effect on the master owners and the record labels and a negative effect on the publishers. Uh, but largely, if you're Sony or Warner Universal, it's been, it's been good business. So, but there's something that everybody should know about, which is as a songwriter, a big part of your revenue is going to come from performing rights organizations like ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and then depending what country you live in, there's there's local you know performing rights in each of those countries that you can sign up for, and that's where a lot of a songwriter's money comes from. It is mechanical royalties, it's sync licensing. When you look at the the publishing pie, but this performance performance rights. Um, you know, which people get confused. It's not live touring, or I mean, that's a small component of it, but it's yeah, about public performance has a specific pub- definition. Public performance, and so getting you know, songs are played on the radio or television, etc. Um, and live venues go into that a bit um, more than people would think. Thing is, that revenue today is is such a big revenue that songwriters and producers say, "Well, gee, I got to get my song on FM radio." <laughs> Which is which is the craziest thing you could say in 2022 because a hit song is a hit song at 200 250 million streams or whatever that we have to look at those as hit songs. Many of those big streaming records never hit terrestrial radio in America or anywhere in the world, and they're mm. still hit songs because we measure hit songs by familiarity and by audience. And so, going into a time where you go and sit and talk to those companies, and we're very loyal to those companies. We made a lot of money with those companies. We love them. But those companies, especially depending on what goes on with these things called consent decrees and just with what happens on a, on, in Washington, D.C., those companies could become a whatever commodity, and FM radio also could be going away because, you know, clearly streaming is in the car and on smartphones, and, yeah. you know, Spotify's made a big push the last month to introduce it to cars and people that don't have smartphones. Streaming is, gonna, is slowly going to replace FM radio. FM radio is going away. Radio is going away, and as we know it, for sure. Companies will tell you, uh, you know, for 80 years, there's been a car dealership in Lincoln, Nebraska that needs to advertise. And I feel like it's something that's said to you right before someone goes out of business. Uh, so, but, but again, I, I can't dog those guys. I love it. Here's one of the issues. There's a bill in dc right now to get a well let, let me let me back up for a second thank you um let me back up for a second if you look at um if you look at the public performance uh, that was never shared with the record companies everybody should know that so that was something just for the songwriter record companies have been frustrated that they don't participate in that songwriters have been frustrated that they don't participate in in revenues from the record company so there's a bill in dc right now to pa- pass a public performance for uh, right for the master owner if that passes then record companies are going to start to participate in performance rights now whether that'll at that point in time go through the ascaps and bmis of the world or, or not you know or not i'm not sure but assuming it does or doesn't which is irrelevant well where does that come from? The broadcasters are not going to want to pay 
you know, uh, uh, a percentage and a half or, or, or 150 percent, sorry, of what they were paying. So yeah. what's that going to happen? What's going to happen? The broadcasters are going to come back and they're going to say, we want to pay songwriters left, less. And that's when songwriting is not a real business anymore. So there's some, real, there's some real serious stuff right now that's going on. I have a client who, who's really smart client of mine I've had for 13 years who's been saying to me for years now if we can't come to the table with the record companies and share our percentage points or, or share it sorry our um, our public performance checks our ASCAP and BMI checks with the record companies which no songwriter wants to talk about but if we can't think bigger and figure out how to share that for them to share with us like this idea that when you look at businesses you sometimes look at the numbers and the rules and you think like who created this like it's and and you look at some of the percentages and it's a total race to the bottom you know and and you know what should happen here is we should put you know put everything in the center and just chop it up and that would be yeah. an equitable way to do it i mean it's not quite that simple but you know when you look at the way you know revenues work in the entertainment business and then it's kind of like well this this needs some revision. Somebody certainly has to come in and fix this, and that's one of them. I think if we can't figure out in the next, you know, few years how to share the ASCAP and BMI checks with the label in exchange for them sharing with us, I think we're totally doomed. Uh, because I think that that master public performance right is going to come in, and um, you know, and there's just it's just how it goes. There's only so much to go around, and it'll end up coming out of the songwriter side. So that's something on the docket right now. Yeah, I never, I hadn't ever thought about that as a strategy. Again, I, I don't, other than having these conversations, I think are valuable. I don't have any like direct access to policy or or, or people advocating in D.C. But thinking about um, trying to combine the revenue streams and divvying them up is not something I'd ever really thought about. It does make sense, especially given that the record labels and the publishing companies are um, in large share, the three majors are all owned by the same companies. It would make sense to try to do that. Is there, is there a way for people to, I don't know, is there a way for people to advocate this? I mean, you, you talked about this earlier that a big part of it would be getting the big artists to come in and say, Hey, we want to advocate for songwriters. You know, where where does this other than like you said, there's these sort of disparate groups of songwriters that are um, they, they do protests, they do other things. There's a few Instagram pages and a lot of wonderful, well-meaning people, some of whom I know personally and love. Um, it, it, is that effective enough? Are there other things that can be done? You know, you mentioned that young songwriters, young music creators, you got to kind of trust that people at the higher levels are going to take care of some of the stuff. Um, presumably you and I or other people are at these higher levels. Some of those people watch these streams. What, what are the steps that can be taken? Is it still just sort of education? Do we have the ability to affect policy? Is it encouraging the people around us who don't feel incentivized or what? For every solo songwriter out there, how can they make change? Yeah, I mean, you know, you said it, it's going to take something more than these groups of songwriters, whether it's the artists or the labels like, I don't even want to think of it as putting pressure, but where the, the people that don't seem to have opinions about this is why I want to have this conversation is because there's a lot of people who are like, yeah, there's something going on and it's something with rates and that might affect me a little bit, but I'm a producer and I don't really know. And I want to look out for my friends or I'm an artist and I know that there's something, but why, you know, there's people who don't really feel like they have a stake in it. And in my mind, it feels like we kind of all have a stake in this. And if we can figure out how to, I don't know, realize we're on the same, this is a very sort of vague thing, but if realize we're on the same team and get people who are not necessarily making their money off songwriting to advocate, whether it's the labels or whether it's the large artists or whatever, who can, who can shift this conversation a little bit? Well, look, every songwriter that's curious about this, if you end up making no impact in the end, you will still have learned something. So, you know, I think following, following and joining the NSAI, you know, which is a strong songwriter's app, Group in, in Nashville, uh, SONA, S-O-N-A, which is in, in Los Angeles, um, following the NMPA um, on online, you know, which advocates for the publishers and songwriters, um, you know, getting involved with the Grammys, you know, which, which the Grammys, by the way, people give them a bad rap for a variety of reasons that aren't worth getting into here, but it's like, 
you know, just a really talk about an organization with an incredible new president who's made huge change and an organization mm-hmm. that historically makes huge policy change. Um, you know, the Grammys are so much more important than a than a an evening show or award show. Once you know, that's just their big fundraiser. So, uh, to really focus on, you know, that are getting involved, and I think. Again, even if somebody doesn't have the size of career to make an impact today, uh, being across what's going on is really, really important. Um, I'll, I'll put the links. Yeah, I'll little, put the links to a bunch of these things on there on, on when I when I put this up because I think it is it is valuable for people to see what organizations are there. I didn't realize the Grammys did so much. I definitely think of them as sort of the awards show. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they really do. You know, there's constantly. Like I'm, I'm in this new songwriters committee. I've been part of the producers and engineers wing committee for a while. Like where we kind of get together and talk about like these are the current issues and things we need to focus on. So it's um, it's definitely it's definitely a real thing. Uh, songwriters specifically, it tends to be more of those other groups. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, there's there's definitely you know I, I mean I can't say enough good stuff about. David Israelite and the NMPA and the NSAI. Um, this guy, Bart Herbison, who runs the NSAI, is just fantastic. Um, you know, these guys, like, get zero credit for, for the things they've done. When just, just to do a little piece on the NSAI for a second, these guys yeah. are the reason why when someone sells their catalog, it's now eligible for capital gains tax. So pr- mm-hmm. prior to these people lobbying for that, if you sold your catalog for $20 million, nobody's feeling bad for anyone paying taxes on catalogs, I think. If you sold your catalog for $20 million, you'd have to pay $10 million, right? I mean, it's right. like 50, 50% tax bracket. Um, these guys, you know, made it made it in a class where you get a, you know, a capital gains tax advantage, like selling any other asset, you know? Yeah. I don't think people were familiar what, a, you know, I don't, people were thinking about publishing and master catalogs you know when covid happened the nsai got it so that or made it so that you know songwriters were eligible for unemployment um you know there there's mm-hmm. just on and on with the, the amazing things these people people do so uh, they're, they're doing god's work because there aren't enough people advocating for songwriters that's for sure so that's the nsai which again and, and i've seen the name david israelite around repost he seems to be he seems to be the guy that gets that gets it right in advocating for songwriters. Um, yeah. I'll certainly have to look more in him. All these guys have been big on bringing songwriters to D.C. for years. You know, we had clients that go down to D.C. and sit in front of these senators and congressmen and basically say, you know, hey, this is how I, like, if you don't fix this, like, I can't put bread on the table for my family. Like, this is how I make a living. I think it's easy to explain what you do if you're a teacher or a doctor or a banker or a lawyer I think when you I think when you look at artists, you know, in the in the in the creative arts, it's like it's hard to get people to understand. Like, I'm going in a room today and I'm making a copyright, and for every songwriter that has their first big hit, um, you know, it's it's kind of like I mean, you know, in, every writer talks about this. You go in a room every day and you do the same thing, and you, you you're in that rooster tail that you're never going to get out of, and. And then one day you write a song that changes it all. And the value of that copyright, um, I have clients where it's like two songs in their career paid for everything, two, three songs, you know, in yeah. their life, in their career. And just seeing the song get licensed and covered and sampled and and just redone and, and, and have these renaissance moments where they become hits again, you know, you just see the real true value of, of a music copyright. And yeah. we have to be protected for a long time. What's actually really funny about, not to get political, what's funny about the whole thing with, um, with the tech companies um, is that, and, and the issues with music copyrights, is when the Music Modernization Act got passed, it, it, was, during, uh, it was during Trump. And it would have never happened during Obama or Biden. Mm-hmm. You know, protection for, um, this is a nonpartisan comment, but protection for yeah. copyrights is really actually more of a conservative Republican value. You know, the Republicans are pretty anti-tech for, for that reason. So, uh, you know, Doug Collins and all these guys, you know, uh, you know, Matt Gates is now like, you can't even say that guy's name. Like, these guys all signed the Music Modernization Act. And I only say it because I think it's funny because, yeah. because the Hollywood, the, the liberals and Democrats in Hollywood had to work 
with the, 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 the other side of the aisle to make that bill happen. And it just, to me, the one nice part about it is it's really, um, you know, it was, it's a great, it was a great moment because you saw two sides that rarely come together, come together for something that's really important. Um, yeah. And, and there's some great people that, you know, Dina LaPolt and some other people that don't get enough credit that really made that thing happen. Um, so I, you know, I, I can't, I can't express enough, um, you know, how great the Music Modernization Act was. And then beyond that, you know, what's, what's hopefully going to happen and everybody should go follow it, but you know, you have the, uh, the rate appeal, uh, right. This is the big thing that's happening right now is that, that, that there was a, there was a set rate that there's the three judge panel, because again, this is like legislation from a hundred years ago that sets the, the government, a judge, a three judge panel or something like that gets to set these rates and they updated them a few years ago. And immediately the streaming services all appealed it and have basically spent tons of money keeping this stuff in court. And they're, they're going to decide it soon, whether they're going to allow this rate change or what's, where's it at? It's going our way right now, but, uh, to be determined and, I will say, again, majors are complicit, you know? I mean, you're talking mm -hmm. about raising a rate year on year for songwriters because of the Music Modernization Act. And at any moment in time, the major record companies could come forward and say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna change these deals, um, you know? And, uh, and because again, Spotify doesn't have that big of a margin. In aggregate, it's a lot of money, but it's yeah. not, big of a margin as you'd think. So again, the, the labels and the streaming services are both guilty on that. And, uh, but, it, but it's going our way. And, um, and uh, I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's great. You know, it, it's a story for another day, but the amount of writers that went to DC and told their story when that whole thing was coming together um, you know, is a great story about like the tech companies have like 90 lawyers in DC against like two lawyers that were representing, you know, the songwriters and, uh, and, and they had brought down, I don't know who the songwriter was, but they had brought down some big country songwriter and it was going, it was going against the writers and going in favor of the tech companies. And I think the judge said, uh, something like, uh, sir, you, you wrote that song, you know, some country song, like, oh, that was the song when we sent our daughter off to college and she starts crying and the, all the lawyers on the other side start grumbling, like you gotta, <laughs> and, and it went in the creator's favor. And I, and I think it's really the power, it shows the power of, of music, you know, and, and art. And, um, and so I think things like the MMA, and other things to come uh, are are important, and uh, and there's good people looking looking out for it. Um, like I said, unfortunately, it's just a fractured bunch of different groups that all need to work to, together better. It is a uh, it is a really important thing that I, I at least try to try to advocate for in my small way. Making art and making things is it's hard to put a monetary value on the importance of that. I mean, you know, so much of how we exist in society is based on charts and revenues and money and and competition and all that there's something really beautiful and simple and important about creating art that is just it's just hard to create a lobbying group it's hard to show why that's so important and usually the people that are making that stuff are not very good at advocating and not very good with money and not very good so i'm you know i'm glad we have people like you out there and and those that are advocating for it but man it's it's hard to figure out what to do because I, I obviously I, I do this professionally and, and make a living, but I, um, it's hard to advocate for art. It's hard to make that argument. And I'm constantly in a place where I'm trying to figure out how to do more of that, encourage more people to make things. I mean, it is a, it, one of the, one of the interesting contradictions or challenges or paradoxes of this time is that because so many people can make music, and so many people can write songs and so many people, as you said before, making hits in their bedrooms, it actually makes it harder for quote unquote professional songwriters because there's so many more people who can also make great music and how we organize and how we, how we lobby for people to make money who are, who are essentially hobbyists who then can have hits and make music with their friends, which again, philosophically is really beautiful, 
but how do you make sure, how do you mobilize those people to to value art in our society? Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how best to do that, but I guess you know we're we're trying through these conversations. Yeah, yeah. Creative creative people are not supposed to be business people as well. You know, usually you're better mm. one side of the brain or the other side of the brain. So you need to have people in your life, obviously that you know that can advocate for for uh, you know for creators and you know it's kind of like I think as a as a, as a songwriter creator in general once it the day you're thinking about money um, is like is like that's like the worst place you can go to right it's like it's like when you're like every writer that's like I need to write a hit song today immediately does not you know it's like everything has yes. to yes. Create, everything has to come from a place of inspiration and from a clear mind and I think the moment that creators get too pulled into having to you know advocate for their own money um, you know it's it's not it's it's kind of taking you it's opportunity cost right it's taking you away from the thing that you should be doing and so you know every every great creator needs a good team and um, and then beyond that you know they're uh, because teams can kind of be myopic and focused on their own business in Hollywood you know there needs to be team members around town that all get together to kind of focus on the 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 the, the, the higher good of everyone so yeah, and, and as you mentioned some before, I'll definitely put those links in the description here and put it up on YouTube and all that. Um, you've got another 10 or 15 minutes here. Um, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about some other things. You know, one of the one of the things we see, as has been mentioned a few times here, is these giant catalog sales, whether it's Springsteen or Dylan or Neil Young or any of these people that have been selling their music. Uh, I know these aren't, they're not exactly one-to-one, -one, but maybe you can you can pull them apart. If it is the case that streaming is not paying the songwriters so much, how is it that these catalogs are selling for so much money? Why is it that they are so much more valuable seemingly than before? Is it is it these businesses are cropping up because like hypnosis and these other things are like, we're just going to spend billions of dollars on songwriting because we believe that they're going to make money in all these other ways? Or Man, what? It's going to take up the next 15 minutes and then another eight hours. Uh, so, okay, well, we, so, we should do this again because I think it's, it's valuable well, for people, but maybe break it down a little. A couple things. So the value of a master today is uh, is is more because of streaming than publishing. So and master again being the, the the for people who don't know it's the it's the recording, not the, the recording. not the songwriting. So, so at face value, when you just kind of whack up the money, it's more valuable for the master. The the thing is. When you have one master, you know, it's not nearly as valuable just in terms of traditional, like the long tail, traditional music rights and what they're worth. Uh, publishing is worth more because it's, it's just, you know, that's the right to the song. So the amount of masters that can be made off of the right, uh, out of, of, off of a song is worth so much more money than one specific master. So right. songs get covered songs get remixed they get sampled and interpolated and they get you know they, they just the, the value of the actual right to that song um is actually I, my argument still worth more when it's just there's a temporary we'll look back and say oh that was a really awkward decade where we needed to work out what the value was in in copyrights and how how the the money was split up but i still think publishing for the long tail is worth more uh, certainly companies in town um, that have pivoted away from publishing to for, to start record companies just because for the kind of the short term value, which I understand of of, of chasing you know the records because the streaming the streaming pays so well on the master yeah. side. Yeah, BMG is a good example of that. Still passionate about songwriters and a great publishing company and good friends of ours. But if you really look inside the boardroom, there it's about the records. You know that's that's what they're pushing. So so it's all good, but I. Yeah, on the on the on the on the publishing catalog sale side, um, you know what what happened was you look back seven eight years ago, and uh, all of this institutional capital started um, started kind of exploring the music business and and buying rights. Um, the the concept of arbitrage is is um, you know I used to say we're millionaires become billionaires. You know basically. I buy something, I buy an asset I, that, that's going up in value. I sit on it and then I sell it later, um, is, is would be the, the good example just to say for music rights. So, um, you know, buying publishing and then watching the 
arbitrage of streaming and just the growth with all of the tech of the value of music copyright. So music copyright in 10 years is going to be so much more valuable than it is today. So for, mm-hmm. for a lot of these companies, all this you know, private equity and hedge funds and venture capitalists, and then, you know, some of them did major publishing companies as well. But, you know, Hypnosis is a good example as one, you know, which are pals of ours, you know, is a public fund that, you know, has gone out and bought a lot of these copyrights. Um, they, for one, have been really disruptive in the sense that they've bought a lot of copyrights that were at majors. So a lot of copyrights that, you know, that I don't think the majors thought they would lose started going to these outside companies like them, um, which has created a, a really interesting, um, you know, problem for the major publishers to solve, you know, which is trying to keep their copyright in-house that they've made a lot of money on. Mm. But, you know, uh, so basically people go in and they value these things like people go in and value a company or any other kind of asset. And songwriters who, you know, maybe had million dollar years in their in their successful moments, you know, um, are now walking out with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 million dollars plus plus and having these crazy liquidity moments that, you know, that people who make art never have. So it's been really, really kind yeah. of amazing uh, for a lot of creators. We've had a lot of clients sell uh, the last two years. Uh, we take those deals really seriously. Um, you know, it's a big, big moment for clients. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it's something that I think is going to maybe die down a little bit this next year uh just with raising interest rates i think it's going to kind of bring bring down heat of that uh corner of the music business um but yeah it's it's been happening a lot and um you know you just you can go read about it i mean it's amazing the amount of stuff that's sold well it's so so it seems like it's an interesting way to think about it which is that a lot of these big money deals that you keep seeing announced famous artists famous songwriters selling their catalog also selling not just their publishing but their master rights their producer royalties all kinds of other things it is a it is a time with low interest rates so therefore big investment vehicles can make bets on even though it's a sort of a weird time for contemporary songwriters working songwriters that they are these big companies are betting that music publishing will continue to grow in value and that we're just in sort of a dip valley right now in terms of revenue. Um, I don't know. I guess it's, it's a little probably disheartening to, to songwriters because it doesn't really help them if you don't have hits yet. And if you're just trying to figure it out, it doesn't uh, having someone sell $300 million of catalog sales doesn't help you. But um, it's interesting that, that, that songwriting is really like a long-term thing. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else on the top argument on songs and and masters of publishing is that it's consist is 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 uh you know as as consistent as gold or oil or other assets you know and i think these companies of the last you know five years have been buying have shown that to the financial community that Mm. if you look at just how consistent music publishing is it's a you know it's, it's it's very consistent and for a lot of you know, for a lot of people, they, you know, there's a lot of people that want to park money in something that's, you know, considered a non-correlated asset, you know, so it's something that isn't going up and down with the rest of the market. And um, so it's been, it's been, uh, you know, it's obviously been a big topic. And I, I, I think it, again, goes down this next year, because if interest rates go up, then it's going to affect multiples, you know, they, they're, they, these are going to be lower multiples um, on, on the sales, and it's just not going to kind of be the gold rush that it was over the last couple of years. Um, do you, yeah. Do you have, um, uh, do you have thoughts? There's, we always get questions about independent artists releasing things um, and about playlisting and things like that. Do you have a sense of, um, is there an ability for independent artists to actually access the main playlists and things like that that are on streaming to get their to get their music on the big playlist? Is it really controlled by major labels? How is that working these days? Obviously, it's changed a lot in the last so, few years, but yeah, it's really funny. In the beginning, it was like um, it was like okay, um, we're all going to have access to the streaming services. At that time, if you could, before it was all kind of driven by, by, you know, before there was such a glut of music and it was like, fill out this form and submit your music and it'll be considered for playlists. Um, and, and management companies and 
tastemakers alike have Spotify relationships uh, with, with playlisters and all that. But those, remember, Spotify made like rock stars out of these executives. These people became the like hottest names in the music business, which is insane. Crazy. Good for all of them. But it's, um, it's interesting because I think, you know, I don't think people really foresaw the amount of control that the major record companies were going to have over the streaming services. You know, some people still say to me, they'll say, well, the only valuable thing left in a major record company is the radio promo department. And I'm like, yes, and the streaming promo department. Um, the major labels absolutely have inside access. And before they really did, um, and, uh, you know, they owned, I mean, they all own playlists. They all own major playlists mm -hmm. with the streaming services. So um, right. I think it's like anything. It's not all devious. It's like, you know, if you're like, hey, we're Capitol Records and we're coming with this new release, you know, next month, like Sony, Warner and Universal have the longest track record of any company, any companies ever of releasing successful music. So it's also just influence and leverage. And, you know, and, and that's what obviously the major record companies you know, uh, feasted on for years with promo departments, you know, it's like, okay, well, if the top 10 at pop radio was four releases from, you know, Universal and three from Warner and, you know, you just kind of look at it, it's like, okay, well, how do you get into that when it's run by Corporate Music America, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think, that, I think independence, it, it, I just think the like explanation for young artists, young writers, whatever, is it's still the same thing, which is just, I think tenacious people that really think about how to build a business and the kind of, you know, the like like how to pay your, someone said this to me once, how to pay your mortgage at the dollar blackjack table. You know, like mm -hmm. the idea of like it takes thousands of little wins um, to build a career. I think, I think people that can figure that out, like you can still make relationships with people at, at the streaming services and you can still get a lot going without a major label. It's just not plug and play. Does it, it, yeah, and I and I'm fine with that because it's like success should be success should be given to the people that figure it out. You know, yeah. this, like like not everybody gets the, the the participation award or the first place ribbon for showing up. So I'm fine with that. But certainly it's 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 challenging and not easy for every artist to figure out. So. Yeah. Um, well, we could. There's a few other larger topics to to get into, but we, we're at about an hour. Um, I, I hopefully this is this is useful to people and um if you if people that haven't watched this before we'll throw this up on youtube it's on my igtv um i appreciate you taking the time lucas your insight is always uh interesting and 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 well uh well thought through so i appreciate it very much and um hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do this again and maybe talk about more managerial things and other stuff oh those are boring Nobody wants to. <laughs> well, people are always asking about things that I don't know about, and you're the person in my life who knows about a lot of them. So <laughs> I appreciate you taking the time, man. My pleasure. All um, right, man. Well, uh, I'm going to jump on the Discord after um, and answer questions from people. My DMs are open. Uh, Lucas, thank you. Love you. Good to see you, yeah. man. See you, brother. See ya. See you see soon, you. man. Okay. Bye-bye.